the BJP-led NDA is locked in a high-stakes battle with the Congress DMK combined for Tamil Nadu, as the BJP eyes more seats from the south. India elections. We on continuous coverage. Very warm welcome. You are watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gampir. It is the 17th of April 2024. Israel and Iran appear to be a step closer to war. Iran, in fact, is threatening to wreak havoc with a secret weapon. It is threatening to use a weapon that's never been used before. This is Abol Fazl Amoui. He, in fact, is the spokesperson for Iran's National Security and Foreign Policy Committee. Amoui recently said, and I'm quoting now, we will confront any Israeli aggression and respond to it. We are ready to use weapons that we have not used before. The question is, what are these weapons? Is Iran hinting at weapons of mass destruction? You see, Iran has been on the threshold of nuclear weapons. But does Iran have one? Iran is threatening to use weapons it has never used before. To get to that, we must first look at what weapons Iran has used so far in what is now just shy of war. On Sunday, Iran atta attacked Israel with over 120 ballistic missiles, 170 drones, 30 cruise missiles. And we are now learning that this operation was called Truthful Promise. Iran's state news agency IRNA has shared details of the weapons that Iran had used for the operation. The first kind being the Emad missiles. These are medium range missiles. They have a range of up to 1,700 kilometers. They can carry warheads of up to 750 kgs. IRNA claiming that these missiles were launched from Iran's underground missile silos. On Sunday, Iran also used Khaybar Shekhan ballistic missiles. These missiles have a range of up to 1,800 kilometers. Interestingly, both of these missiles featured in the IRNA infographic that was published in the run-up to the weekend attack. The infographic had also featured the Paveh cruise missiles and turns out Iran used them as well. Now these missiles have a range of up to 1,650 kilometers and they can reach speeds of up to 900 kilometers per hour. 
We've also been telling you how Iran used drones for its attack on Israel. We are now being told that these were Shahed-136 drones. These, by the way, are the same killer drones that Russia is using against Ukraine. But the world already knows about these weapons. There's nothing secret about them. So these cannot be the weapons that Iran is threatening Israel with. What then are the weapons that Iran has never used before? And could Iran be referring to nuclear weapons? But then Iran insists it has none. Also that it has no plans to make one. But then again, there are facts that Iran cannot deny. And the fact is that Iran has been ramping up its production of highly enriched uranium for a while now. Uranium is the chemical used in making a nuclear bomb. Uranium, of course, is also the fuel used for generating nuclear power. And Iran has a civilian nuclear program. In other words, it harvests nuclear energy. But between 2019 and February this year, Iran increased its amount of enriched uranium from 997 kgs to 5525 kgs uranium that is enriched up to 60 percent is considered near weapon grade by the way in december 2023 the iaea or the international atomic energy agency had said iran had enriched uranium to up to 60 percent purity the un body added that iran has enough enriched uranium to build three atomic bombs let me repeat that for you Iran has enough enriched uranium to build three atomic bombs. That is what the IAEA is claiming. And as I speak, Iran's stock of 60% enriched uranium has gone from 88 kg to 123 kg in one year. We are looking at a 38% increase. And observers believe that Iran is sitting on the threshold of nuclear weapons. They believe that Iran can produce enough weapon-grade uranium for a single bomb in less than a week. Iran can also produce enough uranium for five to six bombs in less than a month. What about the bomb itself? Less than six months is the timeline experts believe that Iran needs to make a nuclear bomb. But you know what? There is no way of knowing when that timeline starts. No one is ever building a nuclear bomb publicly, least of all Iran, which was once tightly bound by a nuclear accord, remember? The infamous JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Iran, remember, entered into this agreement with the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany. Under it, Iran was allowed to enrich uranium for its energy use, but there were restrictions placed on the use of its nuclear facilities. And in return, Iran was given a relief from international sanctions. Six years ago, then US President Donald Trump pulled America out of the deal. And today, JCPOA is all but dead. And all eyes are now on this particular Iranian establishment for the fuel enrichment plant. It is one of Iran's three nuclear enrichment plants, one of the others being Natanz in Iran's central Isfahan province. Fardo is heavily protected. It's a heavily protected facility on the edge of Iran's great salt desert. It was reportedly designed as a secret factory. And nuclear inspectors believe activities here hint at worrying possibilities. Western observers, in fact, say Iran has all it needs to build a bomb. But then again, you must take all of this with a pinch of salt. They are Western observers, like I said. You see, Iran's nuclear program dates back to the 1980s. And while Iran on paper does not have a nuclear weapon yet, it has, without doubt, often used its nuclear program as a leverage against the West. Now, could Iran be doing the same now as it tries to deter Israel from an attack? Or does it really have a secret weapon that it is not afraid to use against Israel? In the past, Israel has pledged to prevent Iran from making a bomb. Israel's spy agency has also allegedly assassinated Iran's nuclear scientists. So could these rising tensions between the two countries be a turning point for Iran's nuclear program? Could it throw West Asia into a nuclear arms race?
or could it start a chain reaction far more lethal and dangerous? On Sunday, Iran stopped inspectors from entering its many nuclear facilities. Tehran cited security concerns. And as I speak, Iran has temporarily closed its nuclear facilities. What's going on inside these facilities, though? That is anybody's guess. Is the secret weapon Iran's war rhetoric or is Tehran really in possession of an ultimate deterrent? Again, your guess is as good as mine. Now, one thing is for sure, as Iran and Israel walk towards a war, most of the Arab nations find themselves trapped in this unprecedented conflict. This is the neighborhood we are talking about. Syria, Iraq and Jordan are awkwardly positioned between Iran and Israel. To Israel's north is Lebanon, not too far away. You have Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Yemen, Sudan. Morocco, Egypt. Some of these countries have Iran-backed armed groups, remember. I am talking about Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon. They have groups that are part of Iran's so-called axis of resistance. And then you have countries that have signed accords normalizing bilateral ties with Israel, which is a Jewish country and also the only country in the Arab world where Muslims are a minority. In 1979, Egypt established diplomatic ties with Israel. Jordan followed suit. This was in the year 1994. The U.S. also brokered deals between the UAE and Israel. Also Bahrain and Israel, Sudan and Israel. Will these countries be forced to take sides in the Israel-Iran war is the question. Will they be forced to fight Iran? Will they find themselves trapped in this war? These questions have spooked the Arab world. They are already putting out disclaimers they hope will stop them from being pulled into the war. Jordan's King Abdullah II has said that his country must not become, quote unquote, the theater of a regional war. Speaking at the governorate of Mafraq, the Jordanian king said his country is committed to upholding its security and sovereignty above everything else. On Sunday, Jordan was among the group of countries that shot down Iranian missiles and drones on Israel's behalf. Jordan's king, Abdullah, claiming the country intercepted the missiles to safeguard its own sovereignty, not to defend Israel. And then you also have Saudi Arabia distancing itself from the weekend's attacks. Some Israeli media reports had claimed that Saudi Arabia also helped defend Israel, that the kingdom also intercepted Iranian missiles. But now, sources higher up in the kingdom have spoken to Arab media. They say that Saudi Arabia did not shoot down Iranian drones and missiles. And then you have Iraq that finds itself on the other side of the table. Iran-backed Islamic resistance operates out of Iraq. And following Sunday's attacks, there was speculation that some of the projectiles could have been fired from Iraq, you know, given its proximity to Israel. But now you have the Iraq Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al Sudani clarifying that his country has not received any reports or indications that missiles or drones were launched from Iraqi land. al Sudani said, and I'm quoting now, Our position is clear and we will not allow Iraq to be thrown into the arena of conflict. So do you see the similarity in the Iraqi and Jordanian statements? It's a shared inclination. These Arab countries do not want to get pulled into a wider war. But then, do they even have a choice? Or are these countries handcuffed by America? I told you about pro-Iran militia in Iraq, but did you know that Iraq also has multiple American bases? There are some 2,500 American troops in Iraq, and we all know the side America is picking in the Israel-Iran war. U.S. President Joe Biden has vowed ironclad iron support for Israel, meaning, come what may, the U.S. will be defending Israel. What about Iraq? 
Will it be forced to follow suit? Will it find itself in handcuffs and without a choice? America handcuffs countries with military bases, you see. Guess which other Arab countries have American bases? Jordan. King Abdullah II wants to stay out of the war, but then will Washington give him that choice when the time comes? And when sirens go off at American bases in Jordan? What about Qatar? America's largest base in West Asia is in Qatar. It is known as the Al Udaid Air Base. It was built in the year 1996. Bahrain also has a US naval base. NSA Bahrain or Naval Support Activity Bahrain. It's the headquarters of the U.S. Naval Forces Central Command. Also the U.S. Fifth Fleet. So will Bahrain be able to keep itself out of the war as American troops in Bahrain get pulled in in the defense of Israel? The U.S. also has bases in Kuwait. There is Camp Arifjan. U.S. troops are reportedly also stationed at the Ali Al Salem Air Base. There are American troops in the UAE's Al Dhafra Air Base. It holds the Gulf Air Warfare Center, which is a training hub jointly operated by the UAE and America. The U.S. has an outpost in Syria. There are U.S. troops in Oman, Saudi Arabia. Before the war started, there were some 40,000 U.S. military personnel in West Asia. That number has gone up since the October 7 Hamas attack. But the fact remains that if a war breaks out between Israel and Iran, say tomorrow, American troops in West Asia will get pulled in. U.S. bases in West Asia will be in war mode. Will the forces fighting Israel and by extension America not attack or bomb these bases? Also, by extension, will the war not come to countries housing the American bases? Since the war in Gaza broke out, American bases in Syria and Iraq have already come under fire. An American secret base in Jordan was attacked by a drone. Three American commandos were killed. I am referring to Tower 22, a base not many people had heard about before the drone attack. These bases are supposed to be highly guarded. They have air defense systems in place, but that has not stopped the attacks on them. Since October 7, U.S. troops in West Asia have been attacked over 160 times, 160 times. So far, these attacks were by Iranian proxies, but now the rules of the game have changed. There is no guarantee that the U.S. bases will not be attacked if a wider war does break out. Some of the countries hosting will find themselves in a precarious position. Qatar, for example, it also hosts a political office of Hamas. Several high-ranking leaders of the Iran-backed group stay in Qatar. Qatar also hosts the office of Hamas's supreme leader, Ismail Haniyeh. Iraq also is an ally of both Iran and Israel's ally, the U.S. Syria has Iran-backed groups and U.S. troops. Same with Lebanon. So then what happens when a war breaks out between Israel and Iran? Will these Arab countries really be able to stay out? Israel's Western allies are hoping it does not come down to a wider war. But what are they doing to stop an escalation? Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been told to exercise restraint, to take the win, as US President Joe Biden put it, to not respond by escalating. That was the French President Emmanuel Macron's advice to Netanyahu. Be smart said UK's Foreign Secretary David Cameron, who, by the way, has flown down to meet Netanyahu and counsel him. What about Iran? Israel's Western allies want to deter Iran. They also want to show the world they are punishing Iran for Sunday's attack. So the plan basically is to beat Tehran with sanctions. But then will the two plans work? Let's start with the plan to advise peace to Netanyahu, to ask him to exercise restraint. Now, that plan is ill-fated from the start. Netanyahu wants political survival, not diplomatic solutions. He wants a wider war, 
not restrained. Netanyahu made this clear in his meeting with David Cameron in Jerusalem today. Bibi said, and I'm quoting here, I want to make it clear, we will make our own decisions. In other words, I am not interested in the call for restraint. Perhaps why he was reportedly dodging calls from the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And during today's meeting, Cameron had told Netanyahu to do as little as possible to not escalate. That advice clearly fell on deaf ears. Coming to the plan of sanctioning Iran now, it's 2024 and sanctions simply do not work. And the West should know best. Together, the US, the UK and the EU, along with their allies, have imposed over 16,500 sanctions on Russia. You heard that right. 16,500. That's the number of sanctions that were slapped on Russia for invading Ukraine. But then guess what? The Russian economy is doing just fine. Its gas and oil sales are strong. Sure, Western companies like McDonald's and Coca-Cola left Russia. But now, similar burgers and fries are being sold under new brands. McDonald's-like burger, for example, is being sold by a Russian burger company named Vukusno and Tochka, meaning tasty. And that's it. No sanctions, no complications. Europe also sanctioned Russian oil only to buy the same Russian oil from other sources. We've been telling you about this. The West knows sanctions have enough loopholes because it has been abusing them. So then why is it fooling the world with fresh sanctions on Iran? Because that's the plan, the U.S. says. It will impose new sanctions. It will target Iranian missile and drone program. Also, the Revolutionary Guard and Defense Ministry. We don't have the details of these proposed sanctions, but we do have a question. How exactly does the U.S. expect these sanctions to even work? Take Iran's drone program, for, ex for instance. Quick general knowledge question. Which country has recently started using and buying a lot of Iranian drones? Russia. Does the West expect sanctioned Russia to abide by sanctions imposed on Iran? These countries are currently using these drones against U.S. allies in West Asia and Europe. I'm sure you know that the U.S. already has a long list of sanctions on Iran. Between 2018 and 2021, the Trump administration imposed more than 1,500 sanctions on Iran. It also sanctioned Iran's national oil company. Sanctions were also imposed on foreign companies and individuals who did business with Iran. They were all aimed at imposing what Trump liked to call maximum pressure on Iran. But then what was the result? Iran is exporting an average of 1.61 million barrels of crude per day. 1.61 million barrels. Iran's oil exports have reached a five-year high. China, for that matter, has increased its imports of Iranian oil. Many Chinese companies are paying for Iranian crude in Yuan. Tankers carrying Iranian oil know how to navigate sanctions. They are engaging in ship-to-ship -ship transfer of oil. They are falsifying location data or just completely going off the radar to evade sanctions. And here's the thing, even if the US wants, it cannot afford to tighten the grip around Iranian oil. We told you why yesterday. You see, by slapping further sanctions on Iranian oil or by ensuring the implementation of the existing sanctions on Iranian oil, the U.S. risks adding to the rising oil prices. Remember, Biden faces elections in November. He simply cannot afford to anger voters. He also cannot afford to antagonize China, which is the biggest buyer of Iranian oil. The reason why I'm emphasizing on oil with regard to sanctions here is because oil is one of the biggest contributors to the Iranian GDP. So is gas. Meaning if US and Israel's Western allies really want to punish Iran or deter Iran from a war, they will want to hit oil or threaten Iran's oil sector because that is where it hurts Iranian economy the most. But like I just told you, Israel's Western allies can do little to nothing here. Sanctions are passé. They do not work in these times. Also, in an election year, you cannot afford to risk playing with oil prices. You would rather let down an ally or score another geopolitical self-goal. 
Let's go straight across now to our correspondents, Jody Cohen and uh, Susan Tehrani are with us on the broadcast. Coming to you first, Jody, bring us up to speed with what you're picking up so far uh, on the ground. Uh, that meeting between David Cameron and the Israeli Prime Minister, what was the takeaway really? And what is the impression that you're getting at this point about where things are headed? Hi Molly, so it's been a tough day and that's because after Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel, Israel has said that Iran has continued to attack Israel every day via its proxies. Now today, 18 Israelis were injured by rockets and Hezbollah has claimed responsibility for that. And on Tuesday, drones were aimed at Israel and Hezbollah claimed that they took out an Iron Dome battery. And remember, that has been key in fending off rockets from Iranian proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah and the Houthis. At the same time, several of Israel's allies have been calling on Israel to show restraint, and that's because of concern for a wider war. And as you said, Foreign Secretary David Cameron has been in Israel today, as well as the German foreign minister, and have called on Israel to show restraint. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu told those foreign ministers that he appreciates their support and advice, but that Israel must reserve the right to defend itself. Um, Israeli government spokesperson David Mensah gave a statement today and he asked what would any country do if just one cruise missile had been fired at their capital, suggesting that they would respond. And I've been speaking to people on the ground here and the feeling is that while responding may carry a risk, not responding could carry a bigger risk. But of course, as you said, there are different options. There are sanctions. Uh, many people would say those are not effective. There's a potential cyber attack as well as military options. Right. Thanks for that update, Jody. I want to uh, just get in Susan onto the conversation as well. Uh, Susan, what really is uh, the West plan here? America has been uh, urging a restraint, uh, calling for Netanyahu to not uh, take that step uh, forward towards a war. But we just outlined why sanctions will not work. So what apart from urging caution and restraint is the U.S. really planning to do with each passing uh, hour and day, um, increasingly uh, taking Iran and Israel possibly towards a war? Yeah, Molly, you know, uh, as Jody noted, not taking action will really provide a greater risk for the Middle East region. I think that's the consensus here uh, in Washington as well, considering the fact that, yes, uh, the United States will impose those sanctions and try to go back to what President, former President Donald Trump really did in dealing with Iran. Uh, but for those sanctions to take effect, it will take some time. As you rightly mentioned, it is not really clear to what extent they will be effective, considering the fact that Iran has been under sanctions for decades and it's really learned the workaround. And it has uh, really buyers like China that are re leaving uh, its economy afloat. But I will say that the United States has been clear, and so have those European countries, that while they do call for restraint rhetorically, they've mentioned time and again that ultimately it is Israel's sovereign decision to react to an attack from Iranian soil. Some might say that what the United States and the West is saying to Israel is hypocritical, considering the fact that none of these countries were directly attacked by Russia uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, but the way that those countries reacted and responded to Russia's attack against Ukraine was anything but restrained and measured. So, you know, there are a lot of discussion about how Israel should operate, but ultimately, I think there is an understanding and a consensus that it, this will be Israel's fight. And for now, at least, we're seeing that the United States is standing by that despite calling for so-called restraint. Some believe the Biden administration is just saying that. So should Israel respond, they can just say, an appeal to those uh, left-leaning voters that we told them to hold, you know, be restrained. They just weren't themselves. Right. And Susan, uh, U.S. of course repeatedly saying that it will not participate in uh, an Israeli retaliation. But uh, again, like we just mentioned, you know, given the American bases in the region and given the kind of um, ironclad defense that the U.S. has guaranteed to Israel, there is no way that the U.S. will not get dragged into this war. And there is no way uh, that these countries we just outlined that have American bases will also not get get pulled in. Yeah, that was a leak from the White House on the night that Iran launched that attack against Israel, where it was, according to quote unquote sources in the know, 
President Biden told Prime Minister Netanyahu that the United States won't get involved. Every comment that we've heard publicly from U.S. administration officials and the Pentagon hasn't really been that the United States won't get involved. It's been that we want to see restraint and we don't want to see a wider war. But I think what happened on the night where Iran attacked Israel, we saw really a shift about the alliance on how many countries, not just the United States, but the United Arab Emirates, France, and other European allies came together to shot down those Iranian drones and missiles in support of Israel. And I think those actions are a lot more telling than what we're hearing uh, behind closed doors or from secondhand sources. So, you know, everyone wants to see peace in the Middle East, but ultimately it doesn't seem like they'll all have a hands-off approach, as you mentioned. All right, we're leaving it there for the moment. Susan and Jody, thanks very much for joining us. A quick look now at what else we have lined up for you on the show tonight. Ukraine's president has signed a controversial mobilization law tightening his clutches on military-aged men left without weapons or a chance to leave the battlefield for Ukrainian men on the front line. Roll calls have now become death calls. We get you all the details. Does North Korea have bioweapons? We get you a detailed report in just a few minutes. You must have seen videos of the Dubai floods. What do you think happened there? Is it climate change or did cloud seeding backfire? How do you hold artificial intelligence accountable? How do you punish robots for that matter? We ask those questions tonight as reports of child sexual abuse using AI becoming the new normal is a dangerous concern. Stay with us till the end. Ukraine is at it again. President Zelensky has signed yet another bill to tighten his clutches on military aged men. The law will come into force a month from now. Zelensky has been desperate, remember, for more soldiers, more ammunition, more aid. Munitions and aid will only come at the West's disposal. But for soldiers, Zelensky can comb through the streets of his own country. And he is not leaving any stone unturned. What is his new, lo new law all about? Let me break it down for you. The new law obliges men to update their draft data. Until now, draft offices had to rely on sometimes incomplete and old data. They would not know if a person is eligible to serve in the army. But now, the new law is supposed to make it easier to identify every single person who can be enlisted. It is a crackdown on men who have been hiding from the authorities. Those who continue to do so can now be punished. Because the law has also introduced new punishments for draft evasion. However, it stops short of severe measures that have been proposed earlier. Such was the public outcry that the bill went through 4,000 amendments after its first reading in February. 4,000. One can only imagine what brutal measures it proposed or if it was merely shoddy work of the politicians. They did accuse each other of drafting poorly worded amendments and lacking the guts to approve unpopular changes. Now, the fact of the matter is, Ukrainian authorities have been beckoning at the youth to fight for the country, but the youth is look looking the other way. They know that the roll call is a death call. Those who were interested in fighting for their country enlisted during the first six months of the war, but the mobilization did not stop. Many Ukrainians don't want to go to war. It does not matter if they meet the eligibility criteria. Some have spent weeks or months hiding from mobilization officers. Many have bought fake medical reports to be exempted. Others fled the country while they could. While a few were able to escape conscri conscriptions, others are being forced into it. Recruiting officers are becoming increasingly aggressive. They want to replenish the ranks no matter what it takes. 
In fact, there have been instances when they have pulled men off the streets and whisked them to recruiting centers. They have reportedly used intimidation, physical force even. They have confiscated passports, snatched people from their jobs. And in at least one case, tried to send a mentally disabled person to military training. That is what the reports say. And do note here, these tactics are not only aimed at draft, draft dodgers. As per several reports, they're also targeting men who would ordinarily be exempt from service. And you know what? The aggressive methods go well beyond the scope of recruiter's authority in some cases. It's even illegal. Recruiters are not empowered to detain civilians, let alone force them into conscription. You see, men who receive draft notices are supposed to report to recruitment offices, not the other way around. But over two years of war ended up blurring the lines, it seems. All the generals can see is that the Russian forces outnumber Kiev's troops up to 10 times on the battlefield and they are well aware of the draft dodgers. And so basically they are outsmarting the evaders with new laws and bills. This one is like the carrot and stick method. I already told you about the stick, as in the punishment. Now here's the carrot. The law has increased payments to volunteers and introduced new incentives to fight. This includes cash bonuses, money towards buying a house or car. And where exactly all, is all this extra money even going to come from? Can a war on country really afford this? Analysts say otherwise. And coming to the most important bit, is the new law going to make any difference on the battleground? It remains unclear how many soldiers could be mobilized under the new provisions. Some serving military personnel, in fact, have expressed concern. They say the law will not be enough to address troop shortages. In fact, a deputy commander of Ukraine's 3rd Assault Brigade has said it is not going to lead to any miracles. But then Zelensky still had to try, it seems. That's all he has been doing. Flailing his arms, looking for something to work. And this comes barely 15 days after he signed another controversial bill into law. This one lowered the conscription age from 27 to 25. And then there was another one targeting men who had been given waivers from military service to undergo another medical assessment. A third bill, now a law, aimed to create an online database of those eligible for military service. And all these rules just to shove people into the army. And you see the door only opens one way. There is no bill or law that talks of troop rotation. Nothing that men mentions some respite from fighting. Many who started serving two years back still haven't got a break. And if they have, it was only to tend to their injuries. Is this how Ukraine plans to win its war? These are human beings we are talking about, not war machines. says only weapons can pose a security threat. Just look at what happened about four years ago. COVID-19 brought the entire world to a standstill. Now what happens if countries start using viruses and bacteria as dangerous as COVID-19 or even worse to declare wars? And there is a term for it by the way. It's called bio-warfare. There's nothing new about it. But what is new is the fact that North Korea might be harboring such lethal weapons. What if it decides to use it? The revelations have been made in this American report. It monitors adherence to arms control and non-proliferation agreements. But it has found that North Korea has been hiding something. The Hermit Kingdom is allegedly genetically engineering ingredients for biological arms. Why exactly? to produce lethal bacteria, viruses, toxins as part of a germ warfare program. Germ warfare program. 
You see, we talk of North Korea and pay all the attention to Kim Jong-un's nuclear program. But then, if the American assessment is to be believed, something much more sinister is going on in the country. The report says North Korea has a dedicated national-level offensive bioweapons program. It has confirmed the existence of weapons designed to spread germs like anthrax and smallpox. This includes germ sprays and poisoned pens. How is the reclusive state even developing all of that? Let me tell you, using advanced gene modification technologies. For those who don't know, CRISPR is short for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Now, this technique is used to selectively modify a living organism's DNA. In simple words, you can alter a living being's DNA to only show the traits that you want. You can design its genetics the way you want. So what North Korean experts can do is that they can take a bacteria, introduce highly infectious and lethal traits in it, and then use it as a weapon to infect its enemies. Sounds scary, right? Few years ago, all of it would have seemed impossible. Yes, the communist regime had long ago acquired the pathogens that small, that smallpox and anthrax. It had also reportedly assembled teams of scientists, but it lacked in technical skills and infrastructure. However, North Korea has overcome that hurdle as well. The U.S. assessment has emphasized that North Korea maintains biotechnology and conventional weapons production infrastructure that can support the development of bioweapons. Uh, from factories that can produce microbes by the ton to laboratories specializing in genetic modification, North Korea has all that it needs. In fact, it continues to improve those capabilities by collaborating with other countries and procuring biological equipment and materials. How serious is the threat, you ask? You see, North Korea's full range of biological warfare capabilities remains unknown. And that is, of course, due to the challenges in estimating stockpiles and monitoring production given the country's isolation. But experts have warned against underestimating the threat. The country has spent developing powerful agents like anthrax. And now comes the American report raising alarm over North Korea's bio warfare capabilities. Could the hermit kingdom give rise to another deadly epidemic, rather pandemic, like COVID-19? We can only hope that it does not. Parts of the UAE have been battered by rainfall. At least 17 people were killed due to flash floods. Streets were flooded. Flights have been grounded. In fact, the Dubai International Airport had to divert arriving flights due to a storm. Floods and heavy rain in a desert kingdom. How exactly did that happen? Is the onus on human interference? Did cloud seeding backfire? Our next report telling you more. Unstable weather, heavy rains, flash floods. These were the scenes that unfolded in parts of the UAE. At least 17 people lost their lives. Floods swept through various parts of Oman and Dubai. Al Ain received a record rainfall of 254 millimeters in less than 24 hours. Roads were logged with water, traffic was stalled, flights were grounded, planes were seen surrounded by flood water. Eventually, the rain eased out, but the disruptions continue. Stranded passengers are still lined up at the Dubai International Airport, one of the busiest in the world. Some were seen waiting on the floor for over 24 hours. Listen to their plight. I'm flying from Paris, uh, Dubai is our layover where we were supposed to connect to another flight, which was which was supposed to take us to Kolkata, India. There are hundreds and thousands of 
other passengers just like me in this airport who have been waiting for 10 hours, 16 hours, some even for 24 to 30 hours. It's not raining outside. It's the weather is clear, it's sunny, uh, water logging, the water level has gone down. How did it come down to this? What went wrong? How did the UAE get inundated by rain? One of the answers is human interference. To address its water issues, the UAE has been carrying out cloud seeding operations. It's been doing so since 2002. For those who don't know, cloud seeding is a process used for inducing rain. How does it work? First, weather forecasters monitor atmospheric conditions and identify suitable clouds. After that, they introduce seeding agents into the clouds. Typically, substances like silver iodide or dry ice are used for the process. These agents stimulate condensation and trigger rainfall. This method can increase rainfall by up to 30 to 35 percent in clear conditions and 10 to 15 percent in more humid conditions. So what happened in the UAE? Just before the floods, the National Center of Meteorology dispatched seeding planes in Al Ain. They intended to take advantage of the cloud formations, but it seems it didn't go exactly as planned. Parts of the country received more downpour than they could handle. There was loss of life and property. Inducing rain is fine, but many areas lack proper drainage which can lead to flooding. And that's exactly what seems to have happened. Meanwhile, there's one man who's taken it upon himself to defend Dubai. Sanjeev Kapoor, former CEO designate of Jet Airways, has been putting out tweets explaining what happened in the kingdom. He also responded to Anand Mahindra's tweet comparing Mumbai and Dubai. Kapoor explained that Dubai's infrastructure isn't equipped to handle heavy rains, unlike cities designed for such weather conditions. Later, he clarified his stance, acknowledging that Mahindra may not have intended to mock Dubai. It's not clear why Kapoor took the remarks on Dubai so personally. Live and let live. That is how the saying goes. But now we seem to have a new version. Live and let die. Why? Because some people don't want to live. They are in so much pain that they would rather rest in peace forever. And I am not talking about physical suffering here. It's also mental and emotional pain that's getting to them. And that is where things get tricky. You see, in case of incurable and painful terminal illnesses, yes, euthanasia has been a legal option in some parts of the world, but now many are opting for euthanasia over psychological issues. And the saddest part is, some of them are awfully young, merely in their late 20s and early 30s. This Dutch woman is the latest example. Her name is Jolanda Fun. This April 25th, she would turn 34, except she doesn't want to. She plans to die that very day. Why, you ask? Because of her mental health. She has an eating disorder, recurrent depression, autism, mild learning difficulties. She was diagnosed with all of this when she was 22. And since then, she has not been able to sustain a job or live a so-called normal life. She has family, a few friends, a boyfriend and a little dog. But still, Jolanda describes her life as constant pain. She says she lives with a mask on, hiding how she truly feels. She feels overstimulated, chaotic and lonely. And all the therapies that she has tried have failed to make her feel better. So what's the solution? Jolanda believes the answer is death. And ever since her counsellor told her that euthanasia is an option, she has only wished for it. You see, Dutch laws permit euthanasia for psychiatric reasons. Netherlands, in fact, was the first country to legalise euthanasia. 
Euthanasia solely on mental health grounds has been allowed from the start. Legally, Jolanda checks off all the boxes. She is going to opt for the procedure. She thinks it is death in a dignified way. It is done by a doctor. Her loved ones can be there and nobody would discover her in an appalling state. I know it's as grim as it gets. Why would a seemingly healthy young person throw away their life, maybe, you are wondering. Well, here's a reminder to keep aside our judgments here and take it how it is. You see, we don't know their pain. We don't know what they have gone through. We are not in their shoes. In fact, in many cases, those willing to opt for euthanasia have felt at peace and happy after scheduling it. Take the case of Zoraya Terbik. She is another Dutch woman who wants to get euthanized. She is scheduled to undergo the process in May. Zoraya is all of 28 years old. She has been suffering from depression and autism. For 10 long years, she tried all possible solutions to improve her condition. From therapy to medications, nothing seems to have worked. At last, her psychiatrist told her there's nothing more they could do to treat her pain. So what can Zoraya do now? She has decided to opt out. She even said that if her appeal was rejected, she would do it herself. Over the years, there have been many such cases. In December 2021, a 33-year-old, Esther Biokema, went for euthanasia. She had been wanting to do it since she was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa at the age of 18. For those who don't know, anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder. Esther would often tell her mother that she wanted to be zero on the scale and did not want to exist. And when she was finally cleared for euthanasia, Esther lied in her childhood bed, in her mother's arms. Her father and brother sat at her feet. A nurse administered a lethal dose of a drug in, et in Esther's arm and she was freed from her pain. Esther's mother understood her decision, but her father always hoped for her to get better, for some therapy to work, for something to work. You see, it's a hotly debated topic. While many countries allow euthanasia over physical pain, it's not clear how, one, how does one apply those rules to mental suffering. The pain is equally valid, of course, but it's also complicated. What are the parameters? Can it be described in clauses? Can human emotions and psyche ever be that straightforward? On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas Tonight. This is me, Molly Gumpir, signing off. Thanks very much for watching. Economic turmoil and global unrest have cast a shadow over President Joe Biden's approval ratings. The rockets are continuing to be fired by Hamas in Gaza, although at a slower rate than previously. So, right now, we are with the volunteers from the Aleppo municipality. They are still trying to go to the rescue for the people they can find out. Libya has emerged as a major diplomatic force at the world stage. The rising cost of living in Nigeria continues to impact citizens from all walks of life. The citizens of Gujarat witnessed a mega roadshow here in the city of Ahmedabad. China is South Africa's largest trading partner for 134 years straight. A domestic aircraft carrying 72 people on board uh, crashed in Pokhara city in central Nepal. 165 injured have been moved, 61 people are confirmed dead and rescue operations continue around me. After receiving an entire season's rainfall in a span of 48 hours, Chennai city has literally been brought to its knees. Well, that's, uh, we are. World is one.